<clears throat> I will now receive the candidate for admission to an honorary degree and call on Professor Sean Ewan, Pro Vice Chancellor, Indigenous. Chancellor. <clears throat> Pat Anderson is a prominent leader and tireless advocate, advocate dedicated to advancing self-determination and the health and education of Australia's First Nations people. Her work spans Indigenous health and education, recognition and the welfare of children with a strong focus on the need for consultative leadership and strategies that address power imbalances. Pat was the co-chair of the Northern Territory Government's inquiry into child abuse and neglect. She consulted closely on the harm being done to children within communities and the ensuing landmark report, Little Children Are Sacred, outlining recommendations to protect Aboriginal children from sexual abuse. She remains stalwart in the face of government inaction and the subsequent intervention and continues to note the great disconnect between what was recommended and the actions taken. Pat Anderson's leadership as chair of the Cooperative Research Centre for Aboriginal Health and now of the Lowich Institute, Aboriginal organisations, academic institutions and government agencies have come together to produce a collaborative evidence-based research. Her commitment to ensuring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are engaged with health research as active participants has developed research capacity improved ethical guidelines and built a cohort of Indigenous researchers who are now leading Indigenous health research. As co-chair of the Referendum Council, Pat oversaw First Nations regional dialogues held across the country to reach broad agreement on how to address the exclusion of Indigenous Australians in the Australian Constitution. These dialogues informed the First Nations Convention at Uluru in 2017, where over 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders produced the Uluru Statement from the Heart, calling for a First Nations voice to Parliament to be enshrined in the Constitution. The statement represents First Nations consensus and has broad public approval. Pat continues to call passionately for this substantive change as an advocate for Indigenous Australians' right to self-determination. Pat Anderson was named as one of 100 Women of Influence by Westpac and the Australian Financial Review. She also received a Human Rights Medal from the Australian Human Rights Commission, a NAIDOC Lifetime Achievement Award and appointment as an Officer of the Order of Australia. Pat Anderson is recommended for the award of the Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa in recognition of her exemplary leadership, her forthright advocacy and her are highly distinguished contributions to health research that benefit not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander peoples, but the nation at large. I now invite Pat to deliver the occasional address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, graduates, families, friends, and colleagues. A special good afternoon to the families who've made it all possible for all of you to be sitting here um, this afternoon, beginning the best part of your lives. I acknowledge and pay respects to the Kulin Nation's traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we are meeting today. I'd like to thank the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor. I am deeply honoured to receive this beautiful gift, an honorary Doctorate of Laws from this very distinguished university. I want to acknowledge the contribution made by eminent scholars, Professor Marcy Langton, and Professor Ian Anderson, who, as part of this university, have made a substantial contribution to the life of the nation. I'd also like to thank Professor Sean Ewan, Indigenous Vice Pro Vice, Pro Vice Chancellor, for his support and his friendship. To begin, 
I would like to share with you a little bit of my story. I grew up in the 1950s in Prap Camp in Darwin. At that time, Prap Camp was home to many families rejected by the mainstream Darwin population. They included the Chinese, Malays, Filipinos, Greeks, and of course Aboriginal families and a few Torres Strait Islander families, just to name a few. Many of those Aboriginal families were also had, had, had also a stolen generation's heritage. My mother, who was one of them, taken by force from her family in Central Australia as a young girl, sometime we think in about the 1920s. My father was a Swedish merchant seaman who ended up in the Northern Territory. In those post-war years, conditions on prep camp were harsh. Outside toilets, open drains, and very, very basic facilities. So, what improbable chain of events led me from prep camp in the 1950s to be, to be standing here talking to you today? And it's pretty amazing, anyhow. Most important, first of all, I had a stable family life and caring parents. That was key. And I didn't know that until I got a whole lot older, how important um, that is. And I was lucky. Two things were central. Education and the struggle for, just, for social justice for our people, which continues today. My mother was never taught, never taught to read and write. This was public policy of the day. The system that removed her from her family, supposedly so she could better herself, denied her that opportunity. But both she and my father were determined that their daughters would get an education. So despite the hardships, my sisters and I went to school. Rain, shine, hail, storm, every day without fail. One could never be sick. And the path this education opened up eventually led me out of Darwin. It led, me, it led me around the world and eventually back home to Australia. It led, it led me to be part of the Aboriginal movement for health, self-determination and justice. It was my education that made my participation possible. So when people talk about the importance of education, it is easy to, dis to dismiss it as another platitude but I can speak from my own experience about how profoundly important it is. And I would say that education is even more essential today, given the great challenges facing this country and indeed the whole planet, challenges that require informed and educated citizens that can hold those powers to account. I would, I would not like you to think, though, that education by itself solves all the issues we all face. As I was growing up, we were still denied many of our human rights. The path of my life has been deeply intertwined with the struggle to realise those rights, as it has been for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait people of my generation and continues today. A key marker, of course, in the struggle was the 1967 referendum. Over 90% of Australians voted yes to change the constitution to ensure, among other things, that we were to be counted as Australians for the first time. This event is rightly looked on with pride as one of the high points in the relationship between our First Nations and non-Indigenous Australians. Today, we are focused on a new movement for, conditional, for sorry, constitutional recognition. This is expressed in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, adopted at the National Constitutional Convention rather, in Aboriginal, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in May in 2017. The Uluru Statement sums up where we see ourselves now and what we believe needs to be done to move forward for social justice. All of us, all of us over 18, have a once in a lifetime opportunity to put in place the foundations for a fair and respectful relationship between this country's First Nations and all those who came after us. So, for those of you graduating today, I have two favours to ask. First, value your education. It might be a bit old-fashioned, but believe me, that's not the case. Value your education. Use it. Build upon it. 
formal education is the important first, first step. Use it to develop an attitude of learning and compassion throughout your life. And using another old-fashioned old word, especially in the careers that you've chosen, do it, with, do it with love. Do it with love. Linked to this is my second request to you. Make social justice a part of your life. Since the 1960s, in many ways, the struggle for social justice has defined my life. But it doesn't have to define your life as long as it is part, make it part of your life. Ask yourself, what kind of country do I want to live in? Think critically for yourself. Question those dominant, loud voices telling you that change isn't necessary, or it isn't desirable, or indeed it isn't even possible. Because whatever those voices say, the journey to ensure a fair and respectful relationship between, between this country's First Nations and those who, comes after, who came after us continues. I have been privileged to be part of that journey. But now, the next step will be taken by your generation, not mine. I invite you to be part of that journey, to shape the future of this country as a just and equal nation. This is your challenge. Thank you.